uh, organizers for inviting me to this seminar this uh, week, these two weeks. I'm enjoying coming to these seminars in the morning and thinking how much easier uh, QCD is than all the theories you guys are studying. I am so happy <laughs> I'm a particle theorist. Uh, the, uh, it's really impressive uh, uh, what we can, uh, the kinds of things we can tackle these days, especially with several hundred thousand hours, CPU hours of computer time, uh, which is uh, fun. So I'm going to talk about renormalization today, and I want to start uh, for the first 10, 15 minutes with a bit of a, a history of renormalization from the viewpoint of particle physics. Uh, and then we'll come to problems having to do with atoms and other things that maybe are more relevant to, uh, to this meeting. Uh, I wanted to start with particle physics and a history in part because a key figure in that history, Ken Wilson, died just a few weeks ago at the age of 77. And uh, Wilson, more than anyone, uh, caused a, a complete uh, rethinking of what uh, quantum field theory actually is for particle physicists. Uh, I'll leave it to you folks to discuss his contribution to condensed matter physics. But in particle physics, uh, the way we thought about quantum field theory was totally transformed uh, in the 1970s and, and 80s. And uh, since it is the main tool for particle uh, physics, particle theory, uh, it really transformed the field in a very, very fundamental way. And I, I want to give you just a little bit of a flavor of that now, in, uh, in part because it's a big deal, a big historical development of the last uh, several decades, uh, but also in, uh, uh, it sets us up well for the, uh, the applications to atoms. So renormalization theory. Uh, I, I went to graduate school in the 1970s and uh, was particle theorist, and so you take quantum field theory very early on. And your first encounter with renormalization theory was calculations, for example, in QED, for example, of the magnetic moment of the electron. And that calculation goes really well at this level. If you're Dirac back in 1929, if you're Schwinger, it's still working really well here. But uh, as you do an expansion in powers of the fine structure constant. But then when you start going beyond those first two terms, which are already spectacularly successful and convince you that the theory is uh, uh, on the right track, uh, once you get the second order in alpha, you get infinity. If you dare to go to third order, it's even worse. It's infinity squared and infinity cubed and so on. And uh, you encountered this very early on in your graduate uh, quantum field theory course. And back in the 70s, uh, what people told you is they said, well, this is the wrong expansion parameter. You really need to look at uh, not the bare coupling, but this renormalized coupling. And the bare coupling is related to the renormalized coupling by uh, uh, an expression like this, which is alpha divided by 1 minus infinity times alpha minus infinity squared times alpha and so on. They said Taylor expand in powers of alpha times infinity, which always struck me as an interesting concept, uh, in order to get an expression like this, substitute this in here, and all of a sudden the infinities start canceling out in a way that looks absolutely miraculous uh, when you first encounter it. And uh, uh, especially after you, you know, finish Taylor expanding in powers of infinity. Uh, but the thing that made you take it seriously was that at the end of the day, uh, you end up calculating this thing and just digit after digit agrees with experiment. In fact, there's another digit now. This is an old slide. And, uh, you know, this is one of the most accurate calculations in the history of science, and, uh, and it comes from this absolutely bizarre uh, formalism, is how it seemed in the, 19, in the 1970s and before. And uh, if you really wanted to find out about it, you're a particle theorist, you go to the standard textbooks and you find 40 page, 60 page chapters with titles like renormalization. Uh, this is page 400. 72, one of those books. There are actually only 17 words on this page, and one of them is patience right up there, <laughs> which, 
which was the kind of problem that you dealt with with this subject. It was completely opaque. Even to people like me who wanted to become specialists, it seemed like a complete miracle that renormalization worked, a complete miracle that quantum field theory worked at all, and uh, very, very hard to understand. The problem, just to step back now and put it in its simplest terms, is that if you look at uh, in perturbation theory, it's a perturbative theory, QED, you're expanding in powers of the coupling of a photon to the electron, for example. And uh, if you look in perturbation theory, and say Feynman perturbation theory, or any perturbation theory, time ordered perturbation theory, you find that contributions like this, where electron fluctuates into an electron and a photon, interacts with an external photon, say magnetic field, and then fluctuates back to an electron. That kind of contribution involves a sum over intermediate states, an integral over all possible momenta k for that photon. And the problem is that this integral diverged uh, as k went to infinity. And uh, so it was these divergences that were creating the infinities. And you look at that and you realize that uh, really high momentum states seem to be infinitely important, or you begin to worry that they are. And that should really worry you because uh, in a way your first thought here maybe should have been, well, okay, great, k goes to infinity. Obviously QED can't possibly be right as k goes to infinity or else you wouldn't get infinity. That's almost the obvious idea, but that was like the last thing someone would tell us, say in the 1970s. Part of it was because particle physicists always want to feel like they're working with the ultimate theory and the idea that, that this theory wouldn't be correct, correct, uh, would have seemed kind of alien. But uh, the other reason is that if you uh, think that this just says QED is wrong, it raises the issue of, well, what exactly is happening at k goes to infinity? And of course, it's supersymmetry or string theory, gravity. This is saying that this low momentum state here might only be a, a one electron volt momentum is actually coupled through the quantum fluctuations according to this calculation, to arbitrarily high momenta, arbitrarily large mass states, which means that this simple diagram in reality isn't just QED in here, but it's string theory, it's quantum gravity, it's the whole universe. And this is, of course, a complete disaster, if you believe it, because it says that you can't calculate the magnetic moment of the electron unless you understand string theory, quantum gravity, and all of that, because they're all coupled in through this kind of interaction. It's especially difficult because string theory didn't exist. It was really hard, yes. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure the, the discovery of string theory improved the situation a whole lot <laughs> on that front. But uh, it is, in fact, a very, very scary sort of situation. So the solution to this problem uh, is to put a cutoff in, an ultraviolet cutoff you omit all states with momenta bigger than lambda. Exactly how you do the cutoff is a detail, and I won't get into that in this uh, calculation, and there are many ways of doing it that are correct. Uh, but the idea is we'll put in a cutoff and just throw away all the k greater than lambda states from the theory, and let's pick this cutoff to be as big as uh, we can, which means we'll make it as big as uh, QED is reliable. So you're, you're back in this diagram, you're summing over all k's, and we know that, that uh, QED at some point has to be supplemented by other physics uh, at some value of k, and let's put our cutoff right at that point. So any k below the cutoff is in fact accurately described by QED, but k's above the cutoff aren't. And so we'll pick that cutoff, uh, not arbitrarily, but actually as the boundary between what we know and what we don't know. So we're going to be honest, right? Weren't cutoffs present in the 1950s for doing the theory? Well, I'm not finished yet. I have to talk about the significance of the cutoff. But people didn't actually put the cutoffs in and assign meaning to them. I've just assigned a meaning to it. It's the boundary between what you know and what you don't know. And it's a, a 
part of being, I guess, intellectually honest, right? Well, we won't actually sum over states where we know the theory doesn't work. And we know it's going to fail somewhere. Beyond here lie monsters. Yes. So we've picked lambda to be the boundary between what we know and what we don't know. And unless you're a particle theorist, you're, you, you actually probably are pretty convinced that that, that boundary is not at infinity. Uh, and we'll use this theory only with for momentum much smaller than lambda. We're going to restrict our, our attention to those states. Uh, and that's because we don't have an accelerator big enough to actually get to those momenta yet. And if we did, we'd have to introduce other degrees of freedom, and it would be quite a different theory. But we're trying to look at momenta much smaller th than this cutoff. So this fixes the infinities, obviously, because we've used a cleaver and just uh, chopped the integral up. Uh, but uh, you have to ask, what have we left out with this cutoff? And uh, we've left out k greater than lambda physics. And I've drawn this diagram again. But of course, it's not QED by definition. So I really shouldn't draw this diagram. It's some other theory. Uh, maybe the electron has structure and it has quarkets in it or something, uh, in which case I should really draw that loop in terms of whatever the underlying theory is. But there is something I can say about this without knowing the dynamics, and that is that but these... There is another alternative. It's space and time don't, don't have to be continuous, which is an assumption. It's an initial assumption. If it's continuous, well, if there, they is, are, if they aren't there is no proof that this is indeed like that, because it's discrete. If they have sure, a sure. Well, that would be a thing where it's zero. Here. But I mean, if that's where we're at. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. No, the cutoff could, in fact, be so a space time grid. The language is wrong. No, no. I, no, no. Actually, that's included in this discussion because a, a grid, space time discrete space, of course, this is what I work on all the time, it's lattice QCD. Space time grid is an ultraviolet cutoff, and that's a special case of this kind of cutoff. Uh, but what I can say about the K greater than lambda physics without knowing anything about it is that these intermediate states are way off energy shell. You're violating energy when you go from this to this state. And you're violating it by huge amounts, amounts of water lambda. That means that this, the time that elapses from here to there is very small. It's just by the uncertainty principle. You're allowed to violate energy conservation, but only for short times in quantum mechanics. It means the distance from here to here is going to be very small also of order one of a lambda, since c is equal to one. And so this whole interaction, whatever it is, is happening over a very, very small sort of spatial extent. Uh, and in fact, relative to the wavelengths of these external particles, this is basically happening at a point, right? You've got a resolution in the external particles. They have resolution or wavelength that's one of a p. But this is much, much smaller, much, much longer wavelength than the size of this whole uh, thing, whatever it is. And so you can actually mimic whatever that physics is by a point like coupling. It'll be some number, which depends upon that dynamics. You don't know what it is, but it is some number times that, which means we can add the k greater than lambda physics back into the theory by adding a correction term to the Lagrangian, which is just a local interaction times this number, whatever it is, which if you knew the k greater than lambda physics, you could calculate it from this diagram. But if you don't, you just know that it's a number. And you will, you'll have to measure it somehow. Uh, so we'll add the physics that we dropped with the cutoff back in. But we can do it by adding a, a local counter term, or a local, not counter term, a local interaction to the cutoff in a uh, theory. Now, this is a lot easier to deal with than solving string theory, right? Because it's actually quite a simple interaction. In fact, it's an interaction that we already had in the Lagrangian in this case. And so our final Lagrangian will have a psi bar a slash psi. These are the electron and, and photon fields. It'll have a psi bar a slash psi with a coupling that has two pieces. One is the original uh, part, and the other one is this C0 that comes from the uh, cutoff. And uh, as a result, the coupling constant that multiplies this 
will in fact be a running coupling constant. It will depend on lambda. It will depend on how much of this physics we've decided to mimic with an extra term here. And, uh, and so one has this running coupling. Now, you say, OK, this is uh, obviously an approximation that I'm making. Can I improve on that approximation? And you can. You can take this thing, and if you knew the dynamics, and could calculate this, you could in fact do a Taylor expansion in powers of the external momenta over lambda. Remember, p is much, much smaller than lambda. We're assuming that. And if you do that Taylor expansion for a diagram like this, you're going to get a lowest order term that looks like this. This is just the spinner structure that goes with that, times their original c0. Uh, then you'll get a p over lambda term, a p squared over lambda squared term, p cubed over lambda cubed terms. You get a whole series of terms like this. And if you want to make your theory more accurate than it was on the previous page by including even more of the k over lambda physics, you'll want to introduce new terms into the Lagrangian that generate interactions like this and this. And those are actually very easy to, uh, to write down. They're these things. Basically, the Taylor expansion is just going to give you polynomials and p's. And uh, that kind of interaction can always be mimicked by a local, can be mimicked by local interactions uh, that are polynomial in the basic fields and derivatives of those fields. Uh, and so if you wanted to make your theory a little bit more accurate, for example, include p over lambda corrections, you would add this. If you wanted p over lambda squared corrections, you would add that. There are an infinite number of things you would have to add if you wanted to get all the k greater than lambda physics. But actually, you don't need all of them because p is much less than lambda. So if you're only working to three significant figures, maybe you only need the first term. Or maybe you don't need either of these terms. And, uh, and it's up to you. Again, we've taken the high energy physics, the physics we don't know about, and we've jammed it into a, a list of numbers, of coupling constants, C0, C1, C2. Uh, and uh, in principle, there are an infinite number of those Cs, but in practice, you'll only need a small number of them because you're working way below the cutoff, p much less than lambda. Everything that you can look at can be reduced to local operators, right? If you look at the k greater than lambda physics, this argument just uh, generalizes and you can organize all the stuff that you left out of the theory in terms of correction terms to the Lagrangian that are local. So the summary, just to get to the end of the colloquium part of this talk, uh, the sort of modern view of renormalization theory is that the ultraviolet cutoff uh, gets rid of the infinities. It removes k greater than lambda physics, explicitly removes it from the theory. So it's not explicitly there. Uh, but it also means you don't actually need to, to solve or know what the k goes to infinity physics is. You can't leave these states out. Just because you don't know how to calculate them doesn't mean you can leave them out. Well, actually, if you're a theorist, you could probably make that argument. But, but in uh, real life, we have to be serious about them. And so we add the k greater than lambda physics back in by adding local correction terms to the Lagrangian that mimic the effects of the k greater than lambda physics. Uh, typically, you'll only need a finite number of correction terms to achieve a given level of accuracy. Uh, but if you want more accuracy, you can add more correction terms. And these coefficients, these, these coupling constants like d and f, if you know the k greater than lambda physics, you calculate them from diagrams like this. If you don't know it, you have to measure them experimentally. But you only have to measure uh, a finite number of numbers uh, in order to, to do this. It'll be things like masses and charges, uh, uh, intrinsic magnetic moments, and the like. So, Arbitrary precision is actually possible here uh, without taking lambda to infinity. That's a really important difference from the past. So it actually lets you uh, answer questions like, why is QED renormalizable? And actually, that's, that's a question that would have made, you, you couldn't have asked it. It would, have, would not have made sense uh, in uh, an early 1970s context. Uh, people would have looked at you strangely. 
Uh, and even here, it's the wrong question. The real question is how renormalizable is QED? In practice, real theories are always going to be leaving stuff out uh, unless we're really, really smart, really, really lucky. And if they're leaving stuff out, then uh, honesty demands that you put a cutoff in at the threshold for new physics because you don't want to calculate with a theory that is wrong in, in a, a region where you have new physics. And, uh, and so realistically, any theory like QED or the standard model or anything else is going to have a whole, an infinite number of correction terms uh, like this. It'll have a, a renormalizable part plus a whole set of correction terms. And these correction terms make the theory non-renormalizable technically, right? Uh, but they're also small. They are suppressed by powers of P over lambda. So if lambda is a TeV uh, and you're at a GeV, then this is a, a small correction to this uh, Lagrangian. And, uh, and so you uh, find that at low momenta, the theory appears to be renormalizable because these are not that important. And that actually starts to get at the heart of what renormalizability is really about. It's a, a consequence of looking at low energy approximations to more or less arbitrary dynamics. If you look at low energy approximations to arbitrary dynamics, they tend to be renormalizable theories or free theories. And, uh, uh, and so that's where renormalizability comes from. But it's actually approximate. There will always be correction terms. And the real question is not why is this theory renormalizable, but as I said, how renormalizable is it? How big is lambda? How big are these corrections to the magnetic moment of the electron? Can we see them? And that's, of course, part of what keeps my colleague, uh, Tom Kenosha, to whacking away at the magnetic moment of the electron and the muon is he's calculating it with this part of the theory, hoping that it eventually will disagree with experiment and give you a hint of how big, for example, this term is. And, uh, and so it's really a very, very different attitude towards renormalizability, and it's actually uh, quite an accessible one. The, the, the basic idea is relatively simple. It's the same principle uh, that uh, underlies the, uh, you know, the reason why you can't use a microscope to look at atom structure, right? If you have a wavelength this long, you can't resolve structure this big. What we're doing is we're taking what is really happening at this distance and replacing it by much simpler things but long wavelength probes can't tell the difference. So it's just like the multiple expansion or something. You know, it's the same kind of theoretical move. So. Now, in that geromagnetic fact you showed. I'm sorry, say again? In, in that geromagnetic fact you showed for the electron, you have 10 digits or 12 digits, I don't remember how many. Yeah. All those are computed in QED. Yes. So you don't see any physics there. Uh, you can put a bound on this, no, and the bound is, is around a couple TV. But everything is QED. So far, yeah. So far. So far. So Actually, that's not true. There's, there's, okay, that's, that's the asking, uh, so only QED when it's it, there's QCD. QCD. Okay. So when you need QCD the, and you need electroweak theory. So we know more than just QED now. And so uh, what digit you see that? In the uh, it depends on the electron or the muon. In the electron, you hardly see it at all. In the muon, it's the major challenge with the precision of the muon is dealing with the QCD, the fact that a photon can turn into quarks. And I can't remember the numbers. Uh, you should get Kenosha to come talk, and he will tell you in great detail. It's one of the big challenges, actually, for lattice QCD right now is to help the G minus 2 calculation solve the QCD part of, of it. So uh, QED, this, if you look at the Lagrangian for the standard model, there's a QED part, strong interaction part, weak interaction part. The QED and weak interaction contributions to the magnetic moment are easy to calculate because the theories are perturbative. The strong interaction part is hard. And then do you need one term, two terms in that particular case for the new one? Because if it's one term, that's easy to calculate. If it's two terms, it's a bit more difficult and so on. Uh, it, if you think you can solve QCD exactly, then you don't need any of these terms for the standard model. This is all SUSY or, or extra dimensions or other things, right? So if I... In the calculation they do for 
In the calculations they do now, they, they do QCD explicitly. They don't use effective field theory to do the QCD. They try and solve it exactly, dealing with the non-perturbative contributions. If you trust the uh, strong interaction calculations. Yeah. 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 Uh, actually, magnetic moments are an interesting topic in its own. It, it draws in all sorts of interesting physics, but it's not the topic I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I want to uh, instead focus on uh, applications of this idea of renormalization to uh, uh, atoms. And I was trying to think what topic to actually present here. And uh, I could have talked about uh, lattice QCD, which has become spectacularly successful. This is the golden age of lattice QCD right now. Uh, it's it's uh, been um, uh, extremely successful in very detailed uh, explanations of strong interaction physics, uh, but it seemed less relevant to this conference than uh, talking about these ideas applied to uh, atoms and, and electrons. And so I instead uh, focused on um, some applications uh, to high precision studies of QED in atoms, uh, which are complicated uh, uh, and but provide a very, very nice application for these renormalization ideas in the context of a non relativistic system. So I want to uh, show you a couple of problems there. Uh, just to give you a sense of, of how we use this, we've been using this renormalization tool to simplify uh, uh, s s uh, some problems connected with a, uh, atomic physics, and in particular, high precision small atom atomic physics, which is the, the direction a particle physicist would come in at. Uh, so I want to talk about atoms like hydrogen, positronium, helium, uh, simple atoms. And one of the main things that you uh, uh, figure out really quickly when you look at those atoms is that the probability for an electron having a relativistic momentum is really small in atoms. In fact, it's, it's like a part in 10 to the 10th if you actually calculate it. So these atoms are profoundly non-relativistic, actually. Uh, and it strongly suggests that you would like to expand uh, your theory in powers of p over me, uh, or you know the, the electron velocity, which is of order alpha. Uh, and if you do that, you get a very nice, elegant Hamiltonian that you uh, often derive in advanced quantum mechanics courses, which starts out for I, I did it just for positronium, so that's the two times the reduced mass for positroniums, p squared over m, Coulomb interaction, and then all of your relativistic corrections to this stuff. And there are the sort of ki uh, kinetic energy corrections that come from the fact that the energy is really square root of p squared plus m squared. You just expand that up in powers. You get things like the Darwin term, the spin orbit term, the spin spin terms, and all the standard things that are in uh, advanced quantum mechanics textbooks. Uh, it's really a very lovely sort of Hamiltonian and gives really good results for the energy levels as long as you work uh, just to leading order in v squared. So don't include the p to the sixth, just keep the p to the fourth. Just look at these things in first order perturbation theory. If you try and use it beyond first order perturbation theory, you immediately discover that it's way too singular. Uh, the delta function, if you look at it in second order perturbation theory, diverges from k goes to infinity states. p to the sixth or higher order terms in that would give you del squared of a delta function. You'll get one over r cubed terms from higher order terms. A and these things start introducing divergences all over the place. Uh, and it comes because you're expanding in powers of p over m. So it's derivatives, right? You're taking more and more derivatives of things that are singular. And uh, so what do you do about it? Uh, the sort of uh, old fashioned approach to this was to try and treat relativity exactly. Uh, for example, you could try and use the beta saltpeter equation, which I've uh, written down there for your edification. Uh, this is an absolutely horrible 
thing to do. This is like the worst equation ever invented. Uh, it was probably Beta's biggest mistake. And uh, uh, it's an absolutely ghastly thing to work with. And uh, it leads to all sorts of problems. Uh, you know, things like the fact that QED is implemented order by order in alpha, but this is intrinsically not order by order. It's non-perturbative. Bound states involve things interacting forever, so they're intrinsically non-perturbative. So huge complications in actually implementing the renormalization program. But even worse than that, uh, these kernels here uh, are hugely gauge dependent. If you ask for this like three photon kernel, what is the expectation value of it? In Feynman gauge, it is 10,000 times bigger than it is in Coulomb gauge. So it's just wildly gauge dependent. And uh, if I added another photon, it would be uh, actually another factor of 100. Dis the disparity gets worse and worse. So bound states, working on bound states directly in relativistic QED, extremely bad idea. And uh, uh, you don't really want to do that. You need some other uh, plan. Now, there are other complications from the bound states, which I'll mention, that you'd like to sort of deal with as well. One is that. They actually have quite a range of scales, non-relativistic uh, states, when you're looking at them embedded in QED. Uh, so you're trying to capture the relativistic uh, physics, because uh, not only do you have the kinetic energy, which is mv squared, the typical three momentum, which is mv, but you also have the rest mass itself as an important scale if you're trying to deal with uh, QED. And, and these scales, of course, cover a factor of 10,000 in range, and that's a challenge for any sort of program, having a big, big range of scales like that. And it actually has a, an impact. For example, we tend in, in high-precision QED to expand things in powers of alpha. Like this is the decay rate of orthopositronium, which is, just happens to be something I worked on. And uh, you, in QED, you're used to having expansions that are expansions and powers of alpha over pi, first of all. Forget the pi's here. And not only is this just alpha without pi's, but it actually has coefficients like 20 coming in. This 20, a lot of it is coming from non-analytic terms in alpha, which reflect the fact that this is a non-perturbative system. It's not perturbative in alpha. And uh, you get things like log squared of alpha, which actually is log squared of the, in this case, of the kinetic energy over the mass. Uh, the kinetic energy being m alpha squared and the mass being m. And, uh, and so the log alphas come from ratios of these scales. Uh, and they actually eventually just stop the convergence of these series, actually. Uh, so you, you really do, do not want to tolerate that for too long. So one approach to this is to use a non-relativistic effective field theory. Uh, effective theory, rather, and uh, uh, introduce a cutoff, uh, lambda equals me, roughly. And uh, we're going to use it just for non-relativistic problems, but atoms are non-relativistic problems, ones we're looking at anyway. And by introducing the cutoff, we're, we're immediately preventing all those infinities I talked about. So I'm now thinking about using that Hamiltonian two slides ago but with a cutoff so that I can actually use the, that very elegant thing. But if I have a cutoff, I won't have any infinities. Uh, now, there are several simplifications you can make in QED. Uh, here, for example, the, the only thing that, that uh, interacts, causes interactions, are photons, which are massless. And that actually has a very nice feature because it means that photons of wavelengths comparable to the wavelength of the electron photons with momenta of order the electron momenta, which will be the typical s momentum that an exchanged photon would have, they actually are way off energy shell because their energy goes like p, whereas the energy of the electron goes like p squared over 2m, and, which is much, much smaller. It's smaller by a power of v. And so the photons with this sort of momentum actually are highly virtual, very short-lived, which means you can replace them very accurately by an instantaneous potential. And, uh, uh, and, and a whole family of instantaneous potentials. The only place where that doesn't work is very soft photons. Photons where the, the, the momentum is V times the electron momentum. 
Uh, and that's photons whose energy, energies are of order alpha squared m. They're of order the electron energy. Those are the photons that cause the Lamb shift, for example, in, in atoms. And uh, now luckily, that's the probability of having an electron in a very soft photon is very small, one in a million. So you uh, don't have to deal with them too much. But if you're doing high precision work, you have to deal with them a little bit. And what I'm talking about will replace them by an energy dependent potential, which I can do for a neutral bound state. Uh, at this point, I have no photons left. So I've already solved the gauge invariance problem. There is no gauge. There are no photons. And so if I, once I have these potentials, I shouldn't have gauge invariance issues at all. So I've just outlined as a sketch uh, a, a, a recipe for replacing QED by a non-relativistic Schrodinger equation with a whole series of potentials, a soft potential, and then a bunch of instantaneous potentials. And my, uh, I maintain that I can define this potential in such a way that all of the relativistic effects and QED effects can in fact be captured in this theory, in this context, in a way that does not cause infinity. So I can get the P to the fourth, the P to the sixth, the one over R cubed, the delta function, all of it can be built in to this correctly with, and reproduced to whatever precision you want. The exact result I would have gotten if I had done the beta Salpeter equation, done it beta's way. Uh, I tend, you could, that's where I tend to put it, but you could also have an explicit P to the fourth term if you have a cutoff, or P to the sixth term. Are you going to tell us your strategy for calculating delta V soft? The, uh, uh, I will uh, tell you a little bit about it, and this afternoon I'd be happy to tell you in detail how we do it. Uh, let me tell you at a more elementary level though first just what I mean by a cutoff in this context just so you, you uh, just to be precise about that part because that's the key move. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking anything that's singular at all in the theory and I'm regulating it and the way I like to do it but it's one of infinitely many valid choices but uh, one that works well for a variety of reasons is to go to Fourier space so Take one over r, for example, it's 4 pi over q squared, and then introduce a cutoff, e to the minus q squared over 2 lambda squared, which just suppresses the high q region very, very strongly, obviously. Uh, if you then Fourier transform back, uh, you realize that I've multiplied 1 over r by an error function. Uh, and, you know, familiar sort of uh, regulator, actually. I, I like this particular one because it actually makes the potential, instead of being singular at r equals 0, it's actually analytic in r. And uh, that has some advantages later on, which is why I picked this particular choice. But you don't have to use this. Again, it really doesn't matter how you do this cutoff. Uh, uh, some, the way you do it, you tend to optimize it to try and, and improve your life later on. Why not lower? Could be. No, but why not lower? Be yeah. Because it's pretty high. It's pretty yeah. high. So yeah. do you need to go that high? Because you can no. go much lower. No, you can go quite a bit lower. And uh, in uh, lattice QCD, we use the lattice as the regulator. And we will all the time do uh, simulations with this kind of non-relativistic approximation for heavy quarks with uh, the lattice spacing times the mass equal uh, two or three or four, and the cutoff is one over the lattice spacing. So I'm actually picking very, very uh, cutoffs much lower. And, and so it's, it's up to you exactly what you do. I tend to make it around M because I, I have the correction terms. In fact, that's what this slide is about. Uh, the cutoff, of course, introduces errors. If I put a cutoff into the Coulomb interaction, it's actually going to change the, the Rydberg and, in a way. And I have to correct those errors. Uh, and those errors are corrected by a series of local interactions, just like they were in the, in the, in the, uh, in the field theory uh, discussion before. Here, local interaction means delta function, or del squared of a delta function, or a p-wave version of del squared of a delta function, or delta the n. And so you have a whole series of correction terms that you add in, and they will correct for the cutoff that I put in here, but they'll also 
uh, deal with the delta functions and other things that come from QED itself. It's not a real delta function, but of course a cutoff delta function. So instead of being a constant in momentum space, it's e to the minus q squared over two lambda squared, which if you Fourier transform it, it's just a little Gaussian. And, uh, and so I use a, def a local operator, but with a cutoff built into it in order to avoid the divergences that you get in the, in the sum over states. And I maintain that uh, once you've introduced the cutoff, adding just this one term removes all the p over lambda squared errors. If you want to get rid of p over lambda to the fourth, you add this term. If you want p over lambda to the sixth, you have to add some more terms. How many terms do you want? It's determined by how accurate you want your calculation to be. Uh, and this gets back to your question. Uh, if, if you want to only have a couple of terms, you want to make lambda big. And the biggest you can make it with a non-relativistic formalism is around m. Uh, if you go much bigger than that, you'll start to get pathologies. And actually, we see this in lattice QCD. If we actually take the lattice spacing too small with our non-relativistic approximation, all hell breaks loose. It, it's not a good idea. Are you going to account for the perturbance in B or not perturbance? Account for what? For these terms. Uh, they can be done either way, perturbatively so or non-perturbatively, because they're completely regular. Okay. And in fact, that's... Uh, anticipates where I'm going, which is a non-perturbative analysis of QED uh, positronium. So this is a, a calculate. I should say, by the way, uh, this reference down here uh, goes through this kind of expansion in great detail and uh, for very explicit, very simple explicit examples. And so if you want to understand what I'm talking about, really understand what I'm talking about. This is a summer school lectures uh, from several years ago, actually written just down the hall, uh, or the lectures were written just down the hall when I was visiting here one year. Uh, and, uh, and it explains in a lot of detail exactly how this, this thing works. Uh, but let me now do an example. Uh, and the example I, I wanted to pick was just orthopositronium decay. And I want to do it taking maximum advantage of this technology. So what I'm going to do is, is take a Hamiltonian, p squared over m, p to the fourth over 4m cubed, v, i, w. Here we kept the p to the fourth explicit. We didn't replace it by a potential, I think. That's what we did. Plus instantaneous, plus potential. Uh, now I wanted to look at decay, orthopositronium decay to three photons when orthopositronium decays to three photons, the photons have very high energy, energies of order m over uh, you know, two thirds the mass of the electron. So they kind of leave the theory. And uh, uh, so uh, they're not in the Hilbert space of this theory because of my cutoff. And so uh, they end up represented as imaginary parts in the Hamiltonian. It's a non-unitary theory because of that decay. Uh, it's a very local process, still very short distance process because the photons are relativistic. And so it can again be modeled with local instantaneous potentials and delta functions basically and del squareds of delta functions. Uh, so I would maintain that as long as I have a cutoff, I can model QED by something of this structure with potentials and imaginary potentials for the decay rate for the decays, and I can calculate these Vs by matching the scattering amplitudes computed in this theory, just using standard time-dependent perturbation theory. You match them order by order with Feynman diagrams for E plus E minus scattering, and that's actually how you do the calculation. So I've got lambdas, everything in here is finite to any order because of all my cutoffs, and so I can work out a scattering amplitude to any order in alpha that you want in this theory, what I do is I adjust the coefficients of the delta functions and I choose the potentials and so on, the R dependence, so that the scattering amplitude I get from this agrees with the scattering amplitude I get from QED. Order by order in alpha, power order by order in P over M. And yes? If you use a Hamiltonian once you allow the decay, the system is open and then proper description actually it's in terms of density matrix because introducing the imaginary part you see lots of problems 
Uh, if you put the density matrix, which you don't have, not necessarily Hamiltonian, you'll have something more complicated. Uh, I, I'm going to treat this just a first order perturbation theory because it's incredibly tiny. So the okay. real theory I'm looking at is this. Yes, so this is that's an important that's an important issue, and and this is incredibly tiny contribution, and so you would look at it just the first order, and uh, and so that part I'll re deal with non -perturb perturbatively. Everything else I'm going to deal with per non perturbatively. Once I've determined v. Once I've done the matching to QED, and this, is, by the way, is described. Is the Schrodinger equation uh, with the Peter fourth term hmm? in it? What sure. the last term? P to the fourth with a cutoff. You probably have to put a cutoff on it. E to the minus P squared over 2 lambda squared. Yeah. Is this where the, the um, energy dependence of the V comes from when you match the, uh, the, the primary diagram to the square? Yeah. What you find is there'll be diagrams like that that have uh, very, very soft photons, and you'll end up with logs of E over M in them like that. And they appear. Here's the potential. I've written out little bits of the potential. It doesn't fit on one slide, but it's all in the preprint on the previous page. It's all in, in, this, pre in this paper, rather. And uh, uh, so there's the... the cutoff Coulomb interaction. Uh, here are the uh, leading relativistic corrections. Uh, there are delta functions. This is probably some, I don't know what that is. It's some one over R to the something or other. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of other terms here. It goes on for you know that long. They're all actually pretty simple because they come straight from, uh, it's really just Fourier transforming that first Hamiltonian I showed you on the other page. Uh, mostly it's that. Uh, but again, there's a well-determined formula here, and I'm just showing you this formula to show you what the potential actually looks like. So it's just functions of K and L with cutoffs all over the place. Here's the energy-dependent term from the Lamb shift, and it has logarithms of, of the Hamiltonian minus the energy. So this is uh, you know, a, a complicated logarithm of an operator. and uh, the, uh, uh, this is also from the Lamb shift. Hmm? How do you treat it? Perturbatively or non-perturbatively? Non-perturbatively. But in that case, you, see the, you cannot diagonalize a Hamiltonian because... You do it iteratively. It's a small correction again. Oh, so you, so you do yeah. it by iteration? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It converges, like, instantly. No, it's yeah. high, yeah. but it's yeah. not eigenfunctions. They're nope. not orthogonal in the yep. regular sense and so nope. on. No, you're exactly correct. Yeah. We're lucky in this problem that the... Basic problem is the Rydberg problem, and everything else is a really small correction, actually, and so we can take maximum advantage of that in the numerical analysis. It's a much easier problem than many of the ones you guys deal with from that point of view. Uh, the decay amplitude is the thing I cared about, and I was going to deal with this perturbatively. It has this structure. It's basically uh, a delta function and a finite it's del squared of a delta function, so it's like a finite range correction. Uh, again, it's a very local thing. It happens very locally, the decay uh, in QED. And, uh, and this is the thing I, I, I need to take the expectation value of at the end of the game. And these parameters here have expansions and powers of alpha. And just for your entertainment, I'll show you what some of those expansions look like. Uh, uh, it's actually pretty easy to do these integrals. This is all done with Mathematica because it's all Gaussians and Gaussians. He's cheating. Hmm? He's cheating. By hand. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like. You'll see the cutoff all over the place in here. There are lambdas everywhere. Uh, and those lambdas are there to cancel the effects of you know, these lambdas, these cutoff lambdas, right? And uh, so the coefficients, these are the coefficient functions I was talking about, and they depend on lambda uh, in a way that actually removes the lambda dependence from the final answers. And, uh, and so one calculates this, you do it once, you have that potential, and then you're ready to uh, finish the problem. So we have 
V and W, we can solve the theory completely at this point. Once I tell you what V is and I tell you what W is, you don't need to know QED, you don't need to know renormalization, and you don't need to know effective field theory. You just need to know how to diagonalize a Hamiltonian. Yeah. You have energy dependent potentials. Yeah, just one. Just one. And what do you use for the energy? Is it the energy to bound state? Is it the eigenvalue? Or Iterates. You, I iterate. So I start with minus alpha squared over two and then iterate and it converges very, very quickly. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you should, you can actually get rid of the energy dependent potential and, and uh, by doing a couple channel problem where you have the electron positron on the one hand an electron positron and a photon and solving the couple channel problem, there would be no energy dependent potentials. You would only have soft, very soft photons there. So it's a very restricted space. But it seems like too much bother, given how easy it was to actually work out the potential. But if you have a soft one, then you can have two soft ones. So uh, have each one costs you another power of alpha squared. Alpha squared. And uh, because that's because non relativistic things don't like radiating, right? They've got alpha times v squared. And, yeah. And, and so we're actually uh, lucky here because soft photons are not that big an issue. Uh, uh, so, things I wanted to point out, once you have V and W, as I say, you can solve this theory without knowing QED, without knowing anything about renormalization theory. It's just a straight uh, uh, a numerical analysis program in elementary quantum mechanics. Uh, you have to pick lambda, and uh, uh, I pick lambda equals m for our calculations, but you get the same answer if you pick m over 2 or 2m. The thing is designed to be lambda independent. Uh, it's absolutely divergence free. The potential, v, is completely analytic at r equals 0, actually, because of the way I put the cutoff in. And so there's no singularity at all in the effective theory. Uh, renormalization is built in, as I said, but so is higher order relativity and higher order QED. All of it you get for free uh, if someone has actually done all the work to figure out what V and W are. Uh, you can solve, because there are no divergences to deal with in perturbation theory, for example, you can solve this non-perturbatively. So you could solve the Hamiltonian uh, uh, numerically, you can diagonalize it, you can solve all orders in V, you don't need Rayleigh-Schrodinger perturbation theory. This actually is really useful if you want to move your QED analysis over to helium, for example. Doing QED with one electron is a nightmare uh, if you try and do it directly. Doing it with two is hopeless, but actually the potential uh, here, once you figure out what the electron-electron potential is and the electron-proton potential, it's trivial to take those potentials and just use them for helium and deal, deal with whatever method you like to use to diagonalize the helium Hamiltonian. Use that method, but with these potentials that we compute from the scattering amplitude. So this is a great way to put QED and relativity into multi-electron problems. Uh, the other thing is there are no log alphas in V. Uh, the perturbation theory for V is more convergent than the perturbation theory for gamma or E sub n. And the reason is that those logs come from putting the potentials together and from the, uh, what happens in the integrals, the sums over states between them. And that I can deal with non-perturbatively to all orders. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, V is actually a, a more convergent quantity than En. And you'll get lots of log alphas and higher orders for free from doing things this way. Uh, so, you've defined V and W. Your last step is to solve the, the theory. And what I did is I used a, a basis set of Gaussians because I have analytic functions. That's really a great way of doing it. I found the E's and the size. This is H without the W. And once I had my wave functions, I could then use perturbation theory to work out the uh, decay rate. And it was just two terms like that. And, uh, and then you publish your, your uh, six-digit accurate uh, orthopositronium decay rate, which at the time was the most accurate result. Uh, but again, this stuff is the kind of thing that everyone in this room knows how to do. And uh, the, the key here is to get someone, some QED person, to give you the V and the W. And the key to that 
is to get them to calculate a bunch of scattering amplitudes for you in QED. That's all you need the particle theorist for, is those scattering amplitudes. This stuff you can do yourself with non-relativistic Hamiltonians and non-relativistic physics. It's just scattering amplitudes in, in the Born series. And uh, the matching is trivial. So I'll mention one other aspect about this, uh, just uh, sort of as a footnote, and that's the a numerical analysis bonus that comes from this. Uh, uh, the original Coulomb potential actually is singular, of course, at r equals zero. And that cusp, that leads to cusps in the wave function at r equals zero. And that cusp is a major driver for high precision work on things like helium. People spent all their time figuring out how to deal with the stupid cusp accurately. Uh, and, uh, and that's because if you do sort of straightforward things, you'll find that convergence is appallingly slow. Uh, and you have to somehow acknowledge the existence of that cusp explicitly. Uh, what I just showed you was a theory that I say is equivalent. In fact, much more accurate than just the Coulomb theory. Not only does it have the Coulomb stuff, it has all these correction terms as well. But it also has one other thing, which is that it's analytic at r equals zero because of the cutoff. So even the one over r term doesn't diverge. It's actually a function of r squared. It's analytic. And uh, that means that the wave function at the origin is actually analytic uh, there. In fact, it's analytic in that whole area. And that means you get much better convergence of your uh, numerics when you do it. And I'll just give you one quick example of that. Uh, I was looking at this actually thinking about the lamb shift in helium and how to do it efficiently. And uh, uh, the issue with basis functions is you always have a finite number of them. And you start with ones that are cover the infrared physics, and you add more and more ultraviolet ones up to your budget, basically. Uh, and, uh, uh, but if you have a finite number of basis functions, there's basically an effective cutoff that comes from the finite number of basis functions, because you don't have things that are infinitely small. And uh, if you're analyzing something like the lamp shift, which is roughly like a delta function, actually, you can see what, what the errors are going to be like from this uh, limited basis set uh, issue. Because this integral here, psi, goes like 1 over k to the fourth. So this thing actually is going to go like 1 over lambda to the squared. It'll be the error, right? The error will be what you've left out above lambda that is still in the theory. And uh, if you have the original 1 over r behavior, uh, 1 over r potential, you'll get a wave function that goes like 1 over k to the fourth. And you'll get errors due to truncation of your basis that go like 1 over lambda squared, where lambda is related to the number of basis functions. It's totally different for the effective theory, because the effective theory at very high momentum goes like e to the minus k squared over 2 lambda squared. It's cut off. And that means the errors actually fall exponentially with basis size. And uh, this has a huge impact on the size of the basis set you need in order to achieve the kind of six-digit, seven-digit thing that high-precision QED people want. So here's the lamb shift operator, uh, where you have the exact Coulomb interaction uh, versus a Coulomb interaction that's been regulated. Uh, and it's versus the number of Gaussian basis functions I needed. Uh, and uh, you see a, a power law behavior here and an absolutely dramatic exponential fall. If I'm trying to get six, seven digits, uh, I'm much, much better off using the regulated theory getting rid of the cusp in the wave function and using renormalization to put the, the physics of the cusp back in, but in a form that is actually analytic at r equals 0, which helps the numerics. How many times do you need 1 over lambda to the squared? 2. 1 over lambda squared and 1 over lambda to the fourth is what I used. Uh, and this actually, that paper I mentioned earlier gives lots of examples of this, both analytic ones where you can use perturbation theory and non-perturbative ones uh, that sort of address that sort of thing. Here's the binding energy for the uh, ground state of helium. Uh, and there's that delta function for helium. And again, a huge, huge difference. So this was just me doing a preliminary exercise 
to try and decide whether I, I wanted to give up the precision of 1 over r for my effective theory or not, and I definitely do if I want six-digit accuracy. So uh, that I'm going to do take five more minutes to do one completely different example just to give you, I've, I've really shown you two things here. Uh, now I've shown you how to put relativity and uh, uh, QED into simple potentials which you can then solve numerically even in multi-electron situations. Uh, I've talked about numerical analysis benefit of using renormalization theory, a way of using it to tame one of our cubes, delta functions, that sort of thing, without losing any precision at all. I wanted to show one other use of effective field theory, it's just a different style of use. And I wanted to do this with this group because it's my one and only uh, paper that involves multi-electron systems. And I feel like I, it's, it's not much, as you'll see but it's, it's the, the uh, most I can do. Uh, and this concerns muon decay. Uh, muon decay, uh, particle physicists are interested in the decay of the muon because it gives you a very accurate value for capital G, the weak decay constant. Uh, it can be measured very, very accurately. And uh, uh, several years ago, well, back in 2000, uh, people were talking about next generation experiments to measure the muon uh, lifetime. And the way they measure the muon lifetime is they make the muons, muons plow through matter, ionizing like crazy and so on. They come uh, more or less to rest, thermalize with the material, and then you study the decay when they're more or less at rest. Uh, but they're in material. And one of the questions is what is the effect of the material on the decay rate? Does it actually change the decay rate? Uh, and actually, in a lot of materials, you'll, you'll have a lot of the muons will form muonium, muon electron bound states. Does the bound state have a big effect on it? There's some materials where actually 100% of the muons will actually form uh, muonium if they actually get down to thermal energies. Uh, so what is the effect of that? And back in 2000, people were making estimates of this and coming up with distressingly large corrections. Uh, you can think of some of the effects. Suppose it made a bound state, OK? So the muon now is not on mass shell. It's actually at an energy that is suppressed by alpha squared Me, by the, by the binding energy of the muon electron state. And if you think about the muon, it decays to a a couple of neutrinos and an electron, if its energy is a little bit low, that will cut off the phase space that the final state can, can decay to. And if you try and estimate that, the typical energies of the final particles are of order the mass of the muon. The suppression in phase space is of order alpha squared me. So you would come up with an estimate like this. Now this actually was a good deal bigger than then the, uh, it was actually uh, starting to be competitive with the precision with which uh, the muon lifetime was being measured. And it suggested a really horrendous calculation of trying to figure out whether the, you were getting bound states. And if they were in bound states, was it the ground state, the first excited state, the second excited state? How would you model all of this? And that's not the end of it. It's also the case that when the muon decays into an electron and two neutrinos, the electron is going to interact like crazy with the other electrons there. There'll be all sorts of final state interactions that'll happen. And so how do you deal with those? Uh, also, when you estimate them, very big, very important. The miracle is that actually these two things cancel. And they cancel exactly, and they cancel no matter what electronic system you put them in. Uh, and that is something that I'm going to prove for you now in four transparencies. So how do I prove it? I prove it by uh, observing that I'm dealing with non-relativistic muons, if they're thermalizing into the material. And so a really good theory to use then uh, is non-relativistic QED. This is different from what I was showing you a few slides before, because I'm going to keep the photons in it there, the B and E field. I'm going to leave the, the photons second quantized, just for simplicity. Uh, but you take, instead of QED, I, I can describe a low energy muon by a non-relativistic version of QED using the same kind of cutoff, but now with the cutoff equal to mu. 
And so you'll have d by, t, d by dt, d squared over 2, mu, you'll have a d to the fourth over m cubed, and so on, uh, and uh, sigma dot b, all sorts of things here. Uh, and then you will have, as I did in the previous problem, the decay channel. Uh, uh, the decay, again, is to an electron and two neutrinos, very high energy electron and two neutrinos. That decay is uh, very local in space, and so will, can be modeled by an imaginary park uh, in this Lagrangian. And I'm using the Lagrangian here and for sort of path integral notation just because I'm a, a, a particle physicist. Uh, what's the rule for writing down an effective theory like this is just write down every operator you can think of it with more and more derivatives and more and more fields, and then put in one over powers of, of one over lambda to get the dimensions right. And so for this i gamma mu, uh, I can have a 1 between the psi dagger and the psi. But I could also have a d squared over 2m. d is the gauge covariant derivative for QED. I could also have a d to the fourth over m to the fourth. I could have electron terms, psi dagger uh, electron, psi dagger psi electron. Uh, but that has to have a mu cubed in it just to get the dimensions right. I could have spin. I could have interactions with the magnetic field and the electric field. Uh, all these things can describe things that affect the muon's uh, decay rate. Things in here will affect the decay rate. Things here just affect the, the regular kinematics and interactions of the muons. But basically, I've written down all the operators that you can put in. And the key thing to notice here is that the very first term that you get here is 1 over m u squared. And that is almost the end of the proof. Because the problem I was having was correction terms to free decay that go like 1 over m u. And I'm asserting that, in fact, the correction terms go like 1 over m u squared. And the reason why I'm right is because there is no 1 over m u term that you can make that is gauge invariant, uh, rotationally invariant, and polynomial in the fields. Uh, you could make a 1 over m operator, like uh, uh, psi dagger a0 psi over mu, but it's not gauge invariant. And my theory has to be gauge invariant, because it's QED. Uh, you could do psi dagger id by dt psi, except that d by dt psi is actually equal to d squared over 2m psi. Uh, by the equations of motion. And so uh, just through a field transformation, you can get rid of a term like this and turn it into a term like that. And so uh, uh, you don't need d by dt's in here. Or if you put one in, you can, you can transform it away and turn it into a d squared. So if you uh, look at it, and you, you know how to write down effective field theories, you write this down right away. And, uh, and it captures muon decay to electron to neutrinos, also muon scattering, muon annihilation off of electrons into two neutrinos, just these terms. Uh, but the main thing you notice is that everything is 1 over mu squared, so that if you want to actually work out the decay rate uh, of a muon, the only term that's relevant in the Lagrangian is this term. Everything else has a 1 over mu squared in it. And psi dagger psi in a non-relativistic theory is the number density. Once you integrate over x, it just counts the muons. It doesn't get renormalized. It's just equal to the number of muons. Uh, if you analyze this in free space away from matter, that tells you right away that gamma is the free space decay rate. If you put it in matter, it's still gamma plus corrections like this. Basically. Uh, the expectation value of that is i gamma mu plus 1 over m mu squared corrections for any state that has a mu on here, a mu on there, and then any collection of electrons there. Where does the conventional calculation go wrong? Hmm? You know, in the conventional calculation, people would put in final state interactions very familiar effect. Yeah. Phase space is just modified. I'm saying phase space actually cancels the you final state interactions. Conventional people, had they put in phase space and final state interaction Com correctly, Com would have canceled. Yes, and what was happening is people were publishing papers with one or the other in it. And uh, in our paper, we actually did the conventional calculation. It turns out it's not that hard once you know what you're looking for. But uh, 
uh, for someone who's used to effective field theories, uh, it actually requires no time at all. Yeah. Because uh, it's uh, integrated out of the theory. Uh, the reason is that what I'm doing is the muon, electron, neutrino. So there's the electron, the two neutrinos. This thing here has a real part and imaginary part, but both parts have this really close to that. And the reason is because these all have very high momentum. And so I'm actually integrating that whole final state out of the theory. Now, you might worry about photons coming out, but that's precisely what these terms are giving you and the d squareds up there. Yeah, yeah. The main thing is that this is extremely short distance. And it's short distance because those guys are very relativistic, which means you, know, you can locate the actual decay site uh, to within a wavelength of the electron, which is about 1 over m mu. And that means that this point and this point have to be that close to each other, or else they, they can't interfere with each other. And, and so that stuff is totally integrated out and in here, and will show up as correction terms in this series. So basically, I'm doing a Taylor expansion of this diagram in here. That's what this is. So you know, if you expand it in powers of, of p here, that'll be these terms. If you pulled out a, a, a B field, it would be this term. And, and you could actually work out all of these coefficients just by Taylor expanding this thing, this Feynman diagram. Can I, can I ask a question? You said mm -hmm. in this Lagrangian, you reduce the muons to non-relativistic limit. Yep. But you have a cutoff, which is mu nu. Yep. But you have to add in the Lagrangian for the electron, too. And then it will be a much higher cutoff than you had before. Well, that one I could do relativistically, so that's if I wanted to. I, I don't, uh, and, and so indeed, you have to put them together, uh, you see, so. I don't actually have to take MU, as you said. I could make it ME, and it would still, but actually, that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be the, quite the, good. The, the corrections so will be the one over MU, so you have to yeah. do that. Yeah, no, you're right. And so I'll, I'll treat the electrons relativistically, but since they didn't matter, it doesn't but matter. your argument is based on this level yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can add in the electron Lagrangian, but it doesn't change any term in here. And, uh, and it's really the structure here. And what this really is is gauge invariance. I'm using a symmetry here. And it's how you get at the symmetry very, very efficiently. And it's actually a trick that particle physicists use all the time to estimate things they don't know where there are symmetries, as you write down. If it comes from new physics, you can usually write down an effect of Lagrangian for the coupling of, that, uh, of existing physics to the new physics. And it's very easy to build the symmetries in and observe things like there is no 1 over mu term. Yeah? So the conventional calculation, if you don't include both the final state, is, is wrong. variant? Uh, Can you see that? It, uh, it needn't be, actually. Uh, well, actually, I guess it is. I guess if you actually check that, you would discover that it was. Because it really is a failure of gauge invariance if you don't do it. That's probably true if you did it. If you check the gauge symmetry, you'd get worried. And uh, so I'm done. We use effective field theory. Uh, as I said, it was to do non-perturbative treatment of relativistic QED, uh, even a numerical treatment. Uh, it improved numerical analysis, and it let me uh, get at gauge symmetries and, uh, and other symmetries. And here are a bunch of references. This one, as I said before, in particular, shows that delta function, del squared delta function, smear delta function uh, thing in great detail, exactly how that works, and uh, uh, covers an, uh, a lot of the sort of standard machinery of, of renormalization theory. And then the other ones cover things that I talked about here. That's it. Thank you.
thought about how what you what you talked about today differs from what people have done. No, I talked a little bit. I mean, uh, some of the people who do this muonic uh, hydrogen uh, use effective field theory techniques and yeah, to try and deal with the strong interactions. The is, uh, they don't have a la this idea of, of replacing the high scale by lambda yeah. is foreign uh, to the experts in the, in the field. I, I think there are some of them to whom it is not some foreign. Of yeah. Some, yeah. Of the some of the chiral, I mean, part of the problem there is strong interaction physics coming in and how yeah, you yeah, deal yeah, with that. That's the point. You want yeah. to, uh, Mm -hmm. there's, there's 50 years mm -hmm. of history which is working track down, but there are some people who yep. do that and they will say yep. the results are correct. But uh, I, I'm you're talking about different distances, Jerry. There, you're talking about the radius of the proton and this. Can be a no, 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 no. The radius of the proton then the, it absolutely is this. It's one of the coupling constants. In uh, uh, it comes into the effect of Hamiltonian. Yeah, it'll it'll. Yeah. I don't have the full QED, but if you did a QED analysis of a hydrogen atom, the correction terms that you would add, there would be one that would be exactly proportional to what you call the radius of the uh, electron. And, uh, uh, and it's modeled by something like del squared of a delta function. It's like an effective range type correction. Uh, and it's how it comes in, and it comes in from Taylor expanding the form factor. Right. So it's linear in the effective range or quadratic? It'll be what? It's, it's, it's linear in effective range, the correction, or quadratic in effective range? It's I can't it's R, R, R lambda or R square lambda. It's R squared. It's R squared. It's R squared. It's, R squared. it's, R squared. it's the Q squared. It's the Q squared there. It's one over lambda yeah. squared. Yeah. Yeah. One yeah. Over yeah. Squared. And lambda squared is like 700 MeV or something. Yeah. Lambda 700 so MeV. What, what you can use the effect of field theory very effectively for is uh, uh, relating the energy levels in the muonium to parameters in an effective theory for the, the proton, one of which parameters will be the, the effective radius. What you can't do is actually, uh, and that would allow you from muonic hydrogen maybe to determine the, uh, the radius. What will actually happen is lattice QCD will solve this problem really shortly. I'm actually very sure that they will, and uh, it's a mess now, but it's, it's something that is very straightforward. The discrete nature of the lattice makes it hard to determine the derivative, which gives you great accuracy. The derivative of Q squared equals zero. Just gorgeous stuff on the pion form factor that I saw just two weeks ago. Uh, much easier than the proton, but we've got so much computer time now that, that I don't think the proton can res resist it. So I, you know, I'd be willing to make a bet, <laughs> but uh, but it is the right, a very very good framework for looking at muonic hydrogen. The problem I speak of, it's really hard to get from low Q squared uh, lattice or or in real electron scattering, and that's why it's not known well from electron scattering. But the putative fourth term is always coming in. No, no, it's very easy to get the low Q on lattice. We, we do tiny fractions, uh, you know, 10 MeV, no problem. We've got a, uh, I, I don't have it here, but I could find you a very nice plot of the pion form factor, and it's, you know, and, and this is 100 MeV or something. I mean, it's very, very dense. You get to 10 MeV with the lattice spacing 0.1 The lattice spacing determines the highest momentum. It's the box size that you that determines the lowest momentum, but there are tricks for getting lower momenta than the box size by using non-periodic boundary conditions. So it's actually routine now to to look at arbitrarily small momenta. Uh, that's not an that is not an issue on the lattice. Uh, the issue is more signal to noise with protons, and and actually he'd know more about it than I would, and maybe you're not as sanguine as I am. <laughs> about getting the form factor of the proton very accurately at low momentum. Well, if it can be done for the pion, it can be done for the proton. Yes, yes, and it can be done for the pion 
it'll be like 100 times harder for the proton because of signal to noise. But right now, there's just spectacular agreement between the, the uh, uh, experimental data and, uh, and lattice data sort of point by point, right? You'll have that, and you'll have the, the experimental data, and they're right on top of each other. The radius is in great agreement. Yep, and, and what happens in lattice gauge theory is people screw around for several papers and then finally they get all the, the stuff right and then, and then it's just perfect. And that's happened again and again and again in the last decade. And it's certainly happened now for the pion form factor. <coughs> that one has been done incredibly well. Scattering links have been done. You guys have done scattering links really well. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's something that is very, very soon going to be available. By that, I mean next five years, something like that. Uh, what happens in these things is people do the first try, the second try, the third try. They're kind of feeling their way around the problem. Yeah. I apologize, but... Uh, we have to go on. We, we have another talk in yep. We need a 10-minute uh, break, don't we? Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you again,